Hey everyone, Ben Bellack here, Beverly Hills Super Realtor. Today we are talking about multifamily investment. John Swire and I, our guest today, I have known him now for I think six years. Uh, he has an engineering degree, so it goes without saying he's a numbers guy. He's been in real estate since 2002, selling all product types, but his passion is multifamily rental properties. He's helped clients buy and sell over 500 properties worth over a billion dollars. So he's seen and heard it all. And while he mostly deals in Los Angeles, he's done deals as far away as Texas and Florida. And he was an investor before he was an agent and personally owns about a dozen buildings in LA. He literally wrote the book on investment property called There's No Free Lunch in Real Estate. John, thanks for being here. Ben, thanks for having me. Great to see you. Yeah, great to see you too. So <laughs> let's, just, let's just dive right in. So why did you get into owning investment property? Sure. I, uh, I graduated from uh, business school, UCLA at the Anderson School back in 2000. And I had an epiphany one day. It's probably an epiphany that a lot of people have had, right? I woke up one day and I realized I did not want to work forever. <laughs> I looked around and I said, who are the people I know who don't have to work forever? Who are the people who can go play golf during the day? They typically fall into one of two groups, right? They either own companies where they have people working for them or they own a lot of real estate where their tenants got up and went to work every day to earn money, to pay rent, to pay the, the mortgage. I've owned a couple of companies. I've had as many as 60 to 80 people working for me at those companies. And I realized, you know what? I don't enjoy having 60 to 80 people working for me. <laughs> but I do enjoy owning real estate. So I actually started investing in real estate back in 2001. I was actually an investor before I was an agent. The beauty of owning income property is the ability to create a continually increasing annual passive income stream, which is kind of a lot to unpack if you think about it. But if we break that down, continually increasing, meaning this passive income stream, right, is going to grow every, every year. Why? Because of inflation. A gallon of milk costs more today than it did 20 years ago. It's a passive income stream. What does passive mean? It means I don't do a lot of work for it. I've got a property management company that I engage and I pay them to manage the building, to handle the tenants, to do all the work. Let, I'll stop you there for a second. So let's talk about that. Like uh, I think a lot of people are afraid <laughs> of in of investing there's a fear of investing and i think like you already started to just touch on it kind of the difference between like being a landlord versus being an investor a lot of people when they think about owning income property or they think about owning real estate they think about being a landlord right but i'm not a landlord i'm an investor landlords deal with tenants toilets and trash investors <laughs> deal with writing checks spending money and going on vacations okay the bridge between being a landlord and an investor is engaging a property management firm. So that really is important. I encourage all my clients, we've got great property management relationships, hire a property manager. You want to be an investor, not a landlord. You're not getting phone calls in the middle of the night that the toilet's blocked up. I don't get any of those phone calls. I get emails the next morning saying, hey, John, the water heater went down. Will you approve the spending of $1,200? To which I reply, yes. <laughs> Here's the thing, Ben. Look, investing in real estate is for everybody, okay? Most of your clients look like you and I, right? They're successful people who go to work every day. They understand the value of saving for retirement. They want to have a family. They know that they're going to probably want to send their kids to college one day, and they're wondering, how the heck am I going to do all this, right? How am I going to pay for private school, which in LA could be twenty dollars to $25,000 a year or more? How am I going to pay for private school? then how am I going to send my kids to college? And then when all this is said and done, how is there going to be any money left over for me to retire? Mm -hmm. And the beauty of real estate is you can make this investment today and you can make sure that you have the cash flow to pay for all those things, the private school, your kids' college tuition, and still have cash flow when it's your turn to step back and retire. Before we get into kind of the nuts and bolts of that, you said you started in 2001 with, with a fourplex? I did. So I bought my first property back in 2001. And look, I was like a lot of investors when I first started out. In fact, a lot of my clients now are in a better starting spot than I was in 01. I really didn't know what I was doing in 01. I read a couple books. I knew I didn't want to work forever. And I knew I needed to own real estate to own those hard assets. Um, one of the goals I set for myself, and I think it's really important that people set goals. One of the goals I set when I started investing, I think I was 27 or 28 at the time. 
I wanted to have $25,000 a month in passive income by the time I was 50. And again, you mentioned this, I'm an engineer, I have an MBA, um, I'm a math guy. So I sat down like a math nerd and I backed into this and I said, if I want $25,000 a month in passive, which is $300,000 a year, how much equity do I need to put to work, right? Let's start breaking this down into goals. What do I need to do every month? What do I need to do every year? How much money do I need to put to work? So I bought that first property. I ended up doing some 1031 exchanges. I bought and sold a number of uh, three and four unit buildings. The uh, largest building I ever bought or up to that point was back in 2006. I bought a 23 unit building in Glendale for 3.6 million. That was back in 2006. By the way, when I bought that building, it was literally at the height of the market. Okay. So I bought it in September of 06. I mentioned that it was at the height of the market because a lot of people want to time the market. They think that they're going to time the market. There's always a reason why now is not the time to buy, but that's not true. I arguably bought that building at the peak of the market in 06. That building, when I divested of it back in 2018, was worth $6.7 million. Wow. Okay. The point of that story is we're making a generational wealth investment. We're making an investment for the next 40 or 50 years. Mm -hmm. So don't start, don't, don't try and time it. Don't try and time the market. When you're ready to go, you're ready to go. Okay. So you, you're more insulated than say the stock market where you could buy today and then it falls off a cliff. By the way, I did that with Bitcoin. Um, and whereas it really doesn't matter because, you know, if you buy in the right place over time, it should go up. And I think it's easy for anyone to identify that subsection, that sub neighborhood of whatever town they're in. So with that, um, I would say, look, every city's different, right? In LA, I'm sure the initial investment is probably around 300,000. And I only say that because you, you have to put more down for your non-primary residents. But in, in other places, I'm sure what? It, it, it's probably closer to 60,000, right? Oh, sure, look, I, I used to do a lot of training around the country for agents, helping them incorporate one to four unit income property sales into their uh, toolbox. And in some of the places I would fly to, you could literally buy a fourplex for $300,000 or less and put 20 or 25% down, which is fantastic. In the LA submarket, we are in a core primary infill location. It's mm -hmm. very expensive here. Okay, people invest typically in one of three types of assets, if you will, a single family home, then a one to four unit property, and then a multifamily five plus property. Mm -hmm. I would encourage you if you can bypass buying a single family home and leap to a two to four unit property, you should do that. And if Why? you have enough money to put down to buy a five plus unit building, you should leap and start to that step first. But each step up the rung requires more money. The reason you want to do this is because the properties as you get to five plus unit properties, you have what you would call more of an economy of scale. So I want you to think about this and I'm going to touch on a couple things right now. Going back to my goal of having $25,000 a month in passive income by the time I'm 50. Going back to that goal, if I back into that, that means because I live in LA, I need to own roughly 50 units, okay? Which would be the equivalent of 10 five unit buildings or five 10 unit buildings or two 25 unit buildings. Okay. Obviously it's easier to own two 25 unit buildings than it is to own 50 single family homes. It Agreed? is. It yeah. is. It seems intuitive, but I have a client who, you know, I call him the king of a single family home. He owns 18 single family houses in the San Fernando Valley. And every year I talk to him and I say, Michael, is this the year that we're going to exchange out of those 18 homes into one 30 unit apartment building, right? It would Wait, make life way easier. Can I ask a quick side question about that? By sure. owning more buildings, don't you also have more property taxes? No, because look, at the end of the day, if you own 18 single family houses and they're worth a million dollars each, for example, you have property taxes on $18 million. Right. If you were to exchange out of those into one 30 million, you know, or one $18 million 30 unit building, okay. it's the same property taxes. Same thing. Okay. Fair enough. But the management company has one place to go to instead of 18. Mm -hmm. Way easier. Way easier. Right? So for most of my clients, who I work with in LA, the minimum investment is typically five to $600,000. And I understand for a lot of people who might be watching this video around the country, they're like, oh my God, how am I ever gonna save $500,000? I understand that. It's different for everybody in every place. I will tell you this, you're gonna earn equity in these investments towards that monthly passive income goal in one of two ways. 
One, by making direct equity investments. If you buy a building and you put down $500,000, you've accrued 500,000 in equity. The way that most people are gonna earn a lot more equity though, is by buying a building for say 1.5 million. Say they put down 500,000 on it to keep the math simple. They've invested 500,000 in equity. They bought it for 1.5 million. In six years, that building might be worth $2 million. Guess what? Now you have 1 million in equity. Because again, if I come back to my $25,000 a month number, to get to 25,000 a month or $300,000 a year at a 6% cash on cash return, I need to have roughly $5 million in equity invested. That is a lot of money, my friend, mm -hmm. okay? Yep. I am going to accrue most of that equity through appreciation in the assets I own. Yeah, I mean, but the thing is, is like, as you said, uh, the people that are, it may require 60,000, they can still have an incredible retirement. They can have an incredible lifestyle where they live relative to the cost of living there um, and pick up buildings for a much cheaper clip. I'm almost tempted by hearing what you're saying is instead of buying one building here, buying, you know, 10 for the same, the same initial investment that I could do in, in one of those markets. Listen, there's lots of different ways that you can do this. Um, I try and encourage people to buy close to home. If you don't buy close to home, then I, you need to invest with somebody who I like to call your rabbi, right? Mm -hmm. I live in LA, I've owned property in Texas, I've owned property in Florida, I actually invested in something as far away as Russia. The difficult part about owning out of area is twofold. One, you typically don't know that area that well, okay? Sure. For example, you don't know if you should be north of Wilshire or south of Wilshire, and two, you're relying on some third party property manager to manage an asset for you that you don't know that well, that you can't visit easily. So it's very difficult to have a large degree of control over what's going on. Sure. Um, so I want to go back for a second and, because you mentioned a 1031 exchange. Can you just tell us in a sentence or two before we go to this next point, what, what is a 1031 exchange? Sure. So the government says, when you sell a single family home, you have your 250 and $500,000 exemption, correct? So if you're single, you first 250, you don't get taxed on. If you're married, the first 500, you don't get taxed on. In commercial property, investment property, it's totally different. From dollar one, your uncle, Uncle Sam, your uncle wants his money, okay? So the beauty of doing a 1031 exchange is you don't have to pay any, any taxes right now on that money. So say you have a million dollar gain with a $300,000 tax bill. Instead okay. of paying 300,000 in taxes and having 700,000 to invest, you can take that full million and roll it forward. Mm -hmm. Now, let me give you an example. If you have $300,000 that you would have paid to the government, but now you can use it, that $300,000 at a 6% return generates $18,000 a year or an extra $1,500 a month in cash flow. Additionally, that $300,000 could control another million dollars in asset. Say that million dollars in asset value appreciates by 4% a year. You now realize 4% of a million is 40,000. You just realized another $40,000 equity gain every year. Mm -hmm. So and the 1031 is one of the most powerful tools of real estate investing. Okay, yeah, so they're encouraging, the government is encouraging you to roll your non-primary residence investments forward. Um, 100%, keep the money in the market. Yeah, keep the money in the market. So you touched on very quickly, you said a 6% return, and we're gonna get to this, but just so everyone understands, that's kind of the realistic cash on cash return. And by cash on cash, everyone, what we mean is, is if you buy a million dollar property and you put only 200,000 down as your down payment, the cash on cash return is calculated based on that cash exposure, correct? Correct. You talked about appreciation and you talked about, you talked about inflation. So take us through quickly, like, okay, some, someone can barely get into the market, right? They buy that duplex or that fourplex first. And then how do they end up at that 25 unit building in Glendale that you described? What is, what does it loosely look like? Sure. Well, look, the, the first bit of advice I can give you is this. It's okay to be emotionally attached to your single family residence, or your vacation home. Do not get emotionally attached to income properties. Income properties to me, they're like a black box. They're like a stock. They're like a bond. At the end of the day, 
I look at my apartment buildings as like an ATM machine. The goal is for them to kick cash out every single month and every single year. Okay. Money that I can use to do whatever I want with pay my mortgage, go to Vegas, pay my kids college tuition, whatever it is. Right. But the beauty of that money is it is going to come back every single month. Those checks will be in your mailbox every single month and they're going to grow over time because of inflation. So the amount of money I get every year is going to incrementally increase. When you say because of inflation, you specifically mean because the rent costs are going up just across the U.S. It just 100%. Costs. I'll give you, <clears throat> look, I'll give you an example. When I moved to LA in 1998, I paid $1,250 a month for a two bedroom unit. That same unit in 2006, literally eight years later, was running for $2,450. Okay. So I just want to make sure everyone understands. Okay. So now like five to seven years have gone by. They have, the, the building has appreciated. And now they're what, 1031 exchanging that into the next building? Well, so look, the way I do this with my clients and every you know experience you have is gonna be different depending on who you work with, okay? I know how you work, I know how I work. We're very hands-on people. We want the best for our clients. So for my clients, I'm constantly checking in with them. Every year we do an annual review of their asset. How did the property perform? Did it perform better or worse than we thought? How are we doing with keeping up with rent growth? Were expenses in line? Did we spend money unexpectedly? And what's the building worth? Mm -hmm. Hey, is it time to take this building and either exchange it or do a cash out refi? Because the two tools that you have available to you to grow your portfolio, if you will, to climb the property ladder, to get to those 50 units is to tap into the equity that you built, right? You're either going to do a cash out refi or a 1031 exchange. We've covered a 1031 exchange. Explain a cash out refi. When you buy a building for a million five, for example, and it's now worth some years later, $2 million, okay? You have two options. You can either sell into a 1031 exchange and you buy a new asset. You don't own the original asset anymore. Or option number two is you go to the bank, you do a cash out refi, you take out a larger loan, you own the original asset and you take that money that you got out, the additional funds and you buy a new asset. Mm -hmm. And there's reasons you would do both. Sometimes you buy a building and it's a small building, it's a five unit building and you realize, hey, I don't wanna own five unit buildings anymore. For example, for me personally, I'm at a point in my investing career, I don't wanna own six and seven unit buildings anymore. I'd rather own 16 and 20 unit buildings because again, if I wanna to get to have a hundred units under my control, mm -hmm. it's way easier to control four 25 unit assets than 10 10 unit assets. Sure. But other times you've got an asset that's fantastic, it performs well, it's in a great neighborhood, it's got a great tenant base and you don't wanna sell it. Instead, you do a cash out refi, you take those funds and you go buy another asset. So the bank is giving you a loan based on the, the property as the collateral. And the, the bank is giving you a loan based on the debt service of the property. Right. So in my world, it's less about what the property is worth from an appraisal standpoint, and it's more about what the cash flow income stream can support. Mm -hmm in terms of debt service of a mortgage. And what happens? They ask for some sort of profit loss statement and tax returns? 100%. They're going to ask less. It's less about the borrower and more about the building. What can the building cover? And every, no matter what, every building that you buy or you encourage your clients to buy, even if it's a small amount, it's always going to cash flow. Meaning people aren't writing checks at the end of the month or they're not breaking even. They're still getting some sort of owner distribution check. Listen, that's a great question. I always tell my uh, students in my class I teach at UCLA, I always say, write this down, tattoo it on your forehead. <laughs> you will have cash flow, okay? This is very, very important because, and it hurts my feelings sometimes, former students come back to me years later and say, hey, John, I'm ready to buy. They say, I'm ready to invest, but whatever I buy needs to generate cash flow. It needs to break even. I say, my friend, Anything that you buy with five plus units has to cash flow. The bank will require that, meaning hmm. after you pay all your expenses, property management, maintenance, et cetera, and your mortgage, you are going to have money left over every month for yourself. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, if you have a lot of vacancy one month or the water heater goes down that month, you might not have some cash flow. But in general, over the course of the year, you're 100% going to have cash flow. Let me ask you this question. When people are presenting this profit and loss statement or whatever it may be, is there some sort of standardized form the bank likes to see or is it the wild west and people are just sending over random spreadsheets and work? No, 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 listen, everything is, everything is standardized. Again, the agent you know you're working with or the loan broker is gonna walk you through it. Mm -hmm. um, 
for me, I run a very high touch business. So I handle all this stuff for my clients. I want to make sure that they get the correct information to the correct people, you know, and we maximize their uh, loan proceeds. Yeah. I was, that just like question came up for me. Okay. So I want to talk about right now, very specifically, and you've covered some of them, but I think we should bullet them. Let's, let's move forward to what are the four reasons why everyone should own an investment property? Okay. That's a fair question. I mean, look, I think the biggest thing is this owning real estate is part of a diversified portfolio. I'm not anti stock or bond. I will say this. I don't pretend to understand why Amazon or Tesla stock or Apple stock goes up or down the way it does. And I have no control over it. And I don't like not having control. So for me, owning, owning real estate, owning hard assets, owning something secured by a hard asset makes me feel good. I know that, you know, if the zombies come and the world goes to hell and we're not using currency anymore, I can trade housing for food. There's an intrinsic value to the apartment rentals I own. Bottom line, true story. Probably the four, the four benefits of real estate, if you will, the four things you can't do with any other investment truly are one leverage, other people's money, right? This is other a big people's one. money is beautiful. You go to the bank, the bank is typically willing to give you three to $4 for every dollar you put up. Meaning I might be able to buy a million dollar asset with only 30% down. Well, guess what? I get to earn appreciation on that million dollar asset, right? I get to earn appreciation on that million dollar asset, even though I only have $300,000 in the game. If that asset appreciates at 4% a year, which is $40,000 on that 1 million, I just earned $40,000 on my $300,000 investment. Cash flow. Real estate is arguably the only investment right now that gives you consistent increase in cash flow. Some people always say, well, hey, you can buy stocks with dividends. I would say, okay, how many? And most of them have meager yields of 2 to 3%. Again, I'm not telling you to put all your money in real estate. You should have a diversified portfolio. I'm just telling you why real estate outpaces a lot of these other asset classes. And probably the biggest thing and, and, a, and a benefit that a lot of people don't understand is depreciation, okay? Mm -hmm. It's not what you earn, it's what you keep. A, a lot of our viewers on this who live in LA, who live in California, they're gonna appreciate this. We're in a very high tax environment here in California. Okay, so it's not what you earn, it's what you keep. How much of my income can I shield? I try and move as much of my income away from brokerage fees and into real estate passive income as I can, because I can shield that through depreciation. That is arguably one of the biggest benefits of real estate. What, so d dive into that a little bit more. Tell us uh, the, the depreciation 101. What does it mean and how do you use it? I mean, I'm going to give you a real quick overview of depreciation sure. because a lot That's of people, okay. this can be a complicated topic, but think about it this way. If you have a building worth a million dollars, the government says, that building asset value, that $1 million is comprised of two things, the value of the dirt and the value of the structure. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we are going to allow you to depreciate the value of that structure. So let's assume in a place like Beverly Hills, where dirt is very valuable in a million dollar building, the dirt may be worth $400,000 and the structure worth 600,000. If I went out into the middle of Texas somewhere, that dirt might only be worth literally $50,000 and the structure worth 950. Mm -hmm. So as we go into the high rent districts, if you will, right, the mm -hmm. areas like Beverly Hills, New York City and France, San Francisco, the value of the dirt's much higher. The value of the depreciation is lower. OK, the mm -hmm. government says I will allow you to depreciate the asset improvement value, if you will, over 27 and a half years. Mm -hmm. So if I have a million dollar building. And in Beverly Hills, 600,000 of that is attributed to the structure. I divide 600,000 by 27 and a half, and I get roughly a $22,000 a year depreciation expense. And what I get to do is whatever my income is after all my rent collection, less all my expenses, I then get to subtract the depreciation before I go to pay my taxes. So for wow. example, mm -hmm. if you're at a 40% tax rate and you're depreciating 22,000 a year, 40% of 22,000 is an $8,800 tax savings. Yeah. A lot of money. If I invest money in the stock market and I earn a 10% cash on cash return pre-tax, at my tax rate in California, 10% becomes 5%. So 10% pre-tax is 5% after tax for my stock portfolio, for mm -hmm. example. In real estate, if I earn a 6% pre-tax return on my real estate portfolio, I can shield all that through depreciation 6% pre-tax becomes 6% after tax. Guess what? 
6% is better than 5%. My real estate portfolio outpaces my stock portfolio and I have way more control over it. Mm -hmm. And it's secured by a hard asset. I'm not going to wake up tomorrow and somehow, ironically, the stock was delisted or it went away. Okay, so I'm going to just quickly um, summarize those bullet points and then we're going to move to the next section here. So guys, one, you leverage the bank. For every dollar you put in, the bank's going to give you three to four dollars. And while they may charge you a very, very small fee in the, in the form of interest, when the property becomes, when it's worth more money and you sell it, they don't, they don't take a piece of your profit. Uh, number two, appreciation is really what I was just talking about. You can buy something for a million dollars, hold it, pay the mortgage, and then uh, through inflation or uh, whatever it may be, uh, improvement in the area, the property can then be worth a million five. Uh, you can get owner distribution checks through cash flow and put that money to further use. And then lastly, you get tax shelter in the form of depreciation. These, by the way, are four very, very strong reasons. And I think if you are analyzing other asset classes or investment products and say, what are the four reasons why I should own these things? I don't know that the reasons could be so A, diversified and B, so favorable. What can people expect to, to earn, John? Like, what, let's set some realistic expectations. Sure. You know, look, the first thing I do whenever I meet with a new client is we sit down. One, I want to understand what their goals are and what they're trying to accomplish. And then two, what I want to do is I want to set their expectations. You know, it's all about expectations and perspective. If I have a client who walks into my office and says, John, I need to earn 15% cash on cash on my money, I'm going to say, thank you, but I can't help you. Here's what I can do for you. So what I will tell you is right now in the LA market, and this is probably realistically true of a lot of markets around the country, realistically, you should be able to expect a five to 6% return after all your expenses, property management, taxes, et cetera, and your mortgage. Meaning for every $100,000 you invest, you're gonna earn roughly five to 6,000 a year in pre-tax free cash flow, which is roughly four to $500 a month. And to tie this back into my $25,000 a month goal, it's the same thing, right? If I wanna have 25,000 a month in passive, every 100,000 I invest, if it gives me 500 a month, I know how many of these at, you know, investments, if you will, I need to stack up. The most important thing about this is for people to understand most of the time, you're not making this investment for the current version of yourself. I'm not buying buildings for the 45-year-old version of John Swire. I'm making this investment for the 55 and 60-year-old version when I'm going to be working less, making less brokerage commissions, and I want to have money to live on. Mm -hmm. A lot of our clients, so again, look like you and I, they have young kids or they're going to start a family. They know in a few years, they're going to have two kids in private school. The money they invest today is going to be able to pay for that private school, pay for their college education, and then they're still going to be able to have cash flow once that's over to live on. And remember that cash flow is going to grow every year. So it may start out as a five to 6% cash on cash return. But if you didn't do anything with that building, if you just tell that you didn't do a cash out refi, you didn't do a 1031 exchange, within 10 or 15 years, you could easily earn in 12, 15, 20% cash on cash because of inflation. Yeah, I mean, I, the one thing I can say is, and I've always felt this way after, t after talking with you about this stuff, is that socking away a quarter million dollars, let's say, over my life or even a million dollars into a retirement account does not seem as exciting, frankly, fun, or as favorable as owning a 25-unit building somewhere. And, you know, you're one of the few lucky ones to say that, uh, you know, to say that you've already done that. Would you say that after people um, own their first building, they become hooked? This is the thing, okay? For a lot of people, buying an apartment building and making an investment is on their bucket list. Mm -hmm. So the human condition is such that once they do this once, they check it off and they don't do it again. I always encourage my clients. I say, buy two buildings. Mm -hmm. I guarantee you once you've bought that second building, I guarantee you once you get two wires into your bank account every month, you're going to mm -hmm. be hooked. Every month I get my monthly distributions from the management company around the 17th or 18th. And the other day we're in the car driving and I'm, I'm looking at my phone and all the wires hit. And I said, Hey babe, we just got $19,000 wired into the account. Wow. Buildings. That's a great feeling. My friend that pays for the mortgage that pays for the car payments. It pays for a lot of things. Well, so yeah, and you're also not you, working your face off. It just came in. It just came in. Listen, so once you get that second building, you get those two wires a month, you will be hooked, I promise. Because who doesn't want money? Okay, so, all right. I think you may have said this, but it, 
in case you did, I want you to probably answer this one more time. In 2016, I went to you, one of your talks at UCLA, and you were saying that people were afraid that it was the top of the market. And what would you say, the ones that were afraid in 2016 versus the ones that, that bought, you know, what did they gain versus those that waited? You know, it's funny. I, I was one of those people who probably in 2016 and 2017 and 2018 and 2019 thought we're at the top of the market. What the hell do I know? Okay. Look, first of all, it's a marathon, not a sprint. I can't stress this enough. You're literally making a generational wealth investment. If you start investing in your 30s, realistically, if you're in your 30s today, it's conceivable you will live for another 60 to 70 years. Let that time frame sink in for a second. This is a generational wealth investment. If you do this properly, you will literally take care of your generation, your children's generation, and your grandkids if you do it properly. And you don't need to be lucky and you don't need to save millions. I can show every one of my clients how to retire a millionaire. Here's what I will tell you about timing the market, okay? If I were to pick any investor in LA who's invested in LA for the last 25 years, I don't care if they bought at the peak or the valley. I don't care if they bought at the peak in September 06, like this num that did right here. I don't care. Guess what? They crushed it. Because over the last him, guys, years, not me. <laughs> over the last 25 years, it doesn't matter. Right? We're making a 50, 60, 70 year time horizon here. You know, a lot of people say you make the money on the buy. And a lot of people take this to mean, hey, I'm negotiating on a house or on a, a condo or on a building, and you know, it's listed for a million, but I want it for 975. Well, let me ask you something. When you sell that thing for a million five, is it going to matter if you paid 975, 1 million or a million 25? It isn't. What's going to matter is that you bought it. Because if you didn't bought it, you're not going to realize that $500,000 gain. Sure. All those people who have still been sitting out the market since 2016, because they all have a different reason why it's not the right time to buy. Guess what? They're not making any money. I have clients who have absolutely crushed it in their investments since 2016. Mm-hmm. So don't try to time the market. Just get in and be. Listen, when, you're, when you're ready to invest, invest. The money is sitting liquid, most likely in a bank account somewhere because you're thinking about investing. And this savings environment right now, it's not even earning any money. Mm -hmm. What's it doing? It's sitting there in cash. I know it feels good to log into your bank account, right? You log in and you see why well, I have a million dollars in the bank. This is amazing. Guess what? Take a screenshot of it, I know. it put it on the wall <laughs> and then go spend it. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the high, high yield savings account at the time that we're making this video, it's at like 0.5%. It's dropped a point in a year. I mean, you're talking about, yeah, you're talking about five to 6% cash on cash. And there isn't the volatility of it tanking like the stock market. Granted, there are some years where the market can go down, but over time, generationally, as you say, it goes up. So John, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Um, guys, if you comment below that you want the book with your email, I'll send you a copy of it. Don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe to the channel. We're going to keep bringing great free content your way. Um, John, thank you again for being here. You're welcome, Ben. Always good to see you. You too. All right. We'll see you guys next week.